Friends, my sermon this morning is called The Truth About Salvation. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you like to have a seat? Good morning. Have you ever noticed that sometimes we make things harder than they need to be? We woke up this morning in a very complex world. The relative peace that we have known the balance, particularly in Europe and Asia, since the Second World War, has been upended, hasn't it? There are people right now fleeing for their lives. Others are hunkering down in basements, determined to fight for their beloved city, their beloved nation. The situation is incredibly complex. Do we establish a no-fly zone? Stop importing Russian oil? Do we engage at the risk of escalation? Or do we disengage at the risk of further disruption to our peace and security? I don't know. What I do know how to do is to pray. And I hope you'll consider joining us this afternoon at 4.30 for our choral even song for peace. The situation is extraordinarily complex. But yet, at the very same time, it is simple. Put down your guns, turn your tanks the other direction, and go home. Don't drop cluster bombs over residential areas. It's complex, but yet it isn't. The trouble is, it isn't up to us, is it? I mean, if it were up to me, there would be a sunflower festival today in the Ukraine. There are things in your life, I suspect, that you have made more complex than they need to be. All the what ifs or the what abouts, they come and they cloud our judgment and impede the road to doing the very simple and sometimes right thing. Maybe there's a broken and complicated relationship in your life this morning. Reestablishing a relationship, asking for forgiveness, reaching across a divide, it's complicated, but it's also as easy as picking up the phone and saying, you've been on my heart, how are you? It's complicated, it's easy. Paul addresses this beautifully in Romans chapter 10. I'd love for us to look at it together. You can find it there on page, uh, whatever that is in your bulletin. Six looks like in your bulletin. Um, His topic, is not Europe or relationships, but salvation. Is salvation complicated or is it simple? Is salvation easy or is it hard? We have hauled off and made a walk with Jesus Christ more difficult than it needs to be. Why? Because we've attached things to it. Extras, like extras when you're buying a new car. Don't you want the special undercoating? You know, you're gonna need this supercalifragilistic expialidocious extended warranty that I'm only offering to you right now in the next 10 minutes. I don't need that stuff. What I need is a car. Stuff has been added to salvation. Stuff like religion, moralistic rules, cultural expectations and norms unfounded ideologies, and more. What I need is salvation, not the extra stuff, Jesus. I need Jesus. The extras have made it seem like salvation is far from us, something we can't even really ever be sure that we actually have. The extras come to make us feel bad about ourselves. How can I be a Christian if Jesus is who he is and I am who I am? The extras can make us feel disqualified. It takes a good person to be saved and I'm not a good person, so maybe, here's my plan, maybe if I hang around enough good people at church especially, maybe I can get in. You know how entourages get in when really fancy people go to really fancy nightclubs? If I can just be in the entourage, maybe they'll let me in. Today, I'd like to teach you that salvation is not far, but near. 
salvation is without shame and for everyone. First, salvation is near. How could something that happened 2,000 years ago be near to us? Why do we need to even think about salvation in the first place? Well, the simple answer is this. We are lost in our sin. If you think about it, you'll know it to be true. As good as we humans can be, we can also be bad. The wrong is stronger than the right. Way back in the Garden of Eden, Adam had no need to be saved. He walked and talked in the cool of the garden and was not afraid. But then he ate of the tree that God told him not to eat from, and sin came into the world. Everyone after Adam has been born in sin. So are you like, okay, now at least I know who to blame. All this is Adam's fault. No. There is no condemnation for you for Adam's sin. There's only condemnation for you for your sin. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you remember the picture I painted with the kids up here? That was as much for you as it was for them. God, being holy, cannot by, abide by anything less than perfect righteousness. Therefore, your sin, yours and mine, it does. Remember when I was blocking the young man from getting to God? Your sin and my sin has blocked us from God, separated us from God. There is no hope for us unless we have a Savior. Hear me, only Jesus, His righteousness, His sacrifice, His blood can save us from our sins. Because of Jesus, though, the distance, the gap between you and God has been overcome. Sin made God far. Jesus makes God near. Salvation is near to you. Am I making sense up here? Say yes. yes. How can this be? How does salvation get near to us? Why doesn't salvation, for example, just apply to everyone automatically through Jesus? Think again about Adam. God gave Adam a choice about the tree, right? And he's given you a choice too. You can choose not to have God near you. But you can also choose to have him near you. If you want, Jesus will save you. Just ask him. Now we're ready to look at our text. Look at Romans chapter 10 with me. The very first verse there, verse 8. Do you see it? Paul writes, the word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. In other words, salvation is as near to you as your lips and your heart. Look at verse 9. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Is that all there is to it? Shall we take a vote? <laughs> yes, that is all there is to it. You mean that's all I need to do to be saved? Yes. Is it easy, is that, or is it more complicated? No. Maybe you have made something easy too complicated. If your heart believes it, your mouth can say it. Look at verse 10 with me. This is amazing. For one believes with the heart and so is justified. Yes, believing in your heart that Jesus did what he did 2,000 years ago, that it applies to you, and that you need a Savior and that Jesus is that Savior, what does it bring? The righteousness of Jesus. That gap then is overcome, do you see? God now looks at you through the righteousness of his Son. Look what else it says in verse 10. And one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. Did you know that you have never met a secret Christian? If they told you they were a secret Christian, then it wouldn't be a secret anymore now, would it? Listen, part of being a follower of Jesus is saying that you are a follower of Jesus. It's why we confess the Nicene Creed together. 
We'll do it if I ever get done preaching up here. There is power, listen, in saying those words in the Nicene Creed. And I want to encourage you this morning to say it not to yourself, but to say it as if you are addressing everyone else in the room. That's how it's intended to be. There is power, friend, in confession. You may be thinking, confessing and believing, that's a very low bar. Shouldn't the bar be higher? No. Is the bar low? Yes. There's nothing that needs to be added to this, which leads me to my next observation. Salvation is without shame. Look at verse 11. Oof. These words, my friends, man, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. This is true in a double sense. In one sense, God will absolutely not let you down when it comes to your eternal life. Your hope in him will not be put, will not be in vain. But there's another sense that this is powerful too. Listen, shame is the fuel that keeps empty religion going. When you've done something wrong, when you don't measure up, shame on you. Did you sleep in last Sunday? Shame on you. Have you gotten divorced, been addicted? Do you have a mental illness? Do you have a tattoo? Shame on you. Have you not conformed in any of the 1,000 ways traditional American Christianity tells you to conform? Stay with me. Shame on you. Our vision at St. Thomas is to be inclusive and kind and to learn and serve together. I don't know about you, but I have had enough of shame. I'd like to replace that shame with vulnerability. Bravely sharing who we really actually are with one another and with Jesus so that he can help us walk the journey that is set before us. Church is not for the whole. It's for the broken. And if you're one of those people that you just have to sit up on your high horse in order to be here, can you believe what she's wearing? Mm, mm, mm. You know... He's got a lot of nerve showing his face in here. If you got to be up on your high horse, well then shame on, oh, wait a second. I'm glad you're here too, shame inducing person. <laughs> you just come right on here and sit your shame and self down next to me and lay down that shame based religion. Lay it down and exchange it with the grace and love of Jesus. Listen, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. If you have adopted shame as a big part of your faith, lay it down right now. Jesus doesn't shame you. The church doesn't shame you. I don't shame you. Come and receive this free gift of salvation, of righteousness, of grace, and love, and peace, and freedom. Finally, salvation is for everyone. It turns out that no one is disqualified, not even you. Thinking again about our vision, look at the wonderful statement of inclusion in verse 12. Do you see it? There is now no distinction between Jew and Greek. These religious and racial distinctions are washed away in the cross. The people that you think should be left out are allowed in. That's a great thought for our little prejudiced hearts to ponder, isn't it? Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, do you see it? Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, even the people that the church has told you that God doesn't even love, will be saved. Everyone also, of course, includes little old you. I've met so many people down the years who hold on to the idea of the love of God and believe what we sing in the hymn, Oh, love, how deep, how broad, how high. But it's like they draw this big circle and they include the whole world in it. But when it comes to themselves, they draw themselves out of the circle. God can love anyone, but just not me. God saves everyone, just not me. Jesus forgives, sure, but since I can't forgive myself, 
What good will it do me? Please hear me carefully. The love of God, the blood of Jesus, the power of salvation is strong. It is stronger than that self-condemnation. It is more powerful than your doubt, your fear, and your shame. This is nothing, friend, that you need to earn. It never has been, and it never will be. Don't make this harder than it needs to be. Salvation is near to you. Salvation is without shame. And salvation is for everyone. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.